excited to have you all here. So the agenda today is to debrief the 2023 May CP exam. We just finished just a two days ago. It was over. So we're going to go through where we are right now in terms of the exam format, what AOs typically come up in the sense of statistics, patterns, exam data. I'll show you that today. And after that, we'll talk about the September 2023 CP. Before watching this webinar, I hope you had a chance to watch my other video on YouTube, which is called uh, the guide to CP. It shows the basics of the CP program because we use a lot of terminology in this. And if you're not familiar with the CP, you may not understand it. My name is Gavork. I'm a CPA exam coach. I'm sure a lot of you have heard my name or you've seen us, a few of my videos. I, I'm essentially a person, a tutor who helps students prepare and pass the CPA exams, PEP exams, CP exam, and PERT reporting as well. I've been featured in a lot of places. I work as an instructor in an institute, and I've also worked as a case marker. I work with CPA Canada as a session leader, as a lead panelist, as a mentor, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a ton of experience with CPA Canada, as well as in the educational field, and I'm excited to share all of this with you today. So let's talk about the May 2023 CP. You may have heard some comments about it from your friends, or, or perhaps you're, you're really far away from it, but generally it went really, really well. There were not a lot of IT issues, which we get every now and then, and the exam halls were well facilitated, meaning uh, it was it was pretty comfortable in the exam room. Sure, there were a little bit of a noise from students, uh, like some people have told me that there was like angry typing going on next to them. So you can take earplugs and wear those. But otherwise, it was generally well facilitated. The exam was held across the nation. We are not in hotel rooms anymore. You may have heard about it that during the pandemic, we had the exam in hotel rooms, but that's no longer the case. It was in the exam centers. These are the laptops that you get from CPA. So you're not allowed to take your laptop there. They're going to give you their own laptop. You you should take your mouse, by the way. The As you can see in this picture, there's a wired mouse. The best tip I can give you about the, the laptops is, A, take a mouse. B, be used to a little bit of a slugginess because the secure clan software, which you don't have access to until the exam, it's a little bit slower than Microsoft Word and Excel. So you have to uh, compensate for a couple of more minutes that you're going to have to wait for the program to respond to you, like for the entire exam duration. So just prepared of, be prepared for a little bit of a slugginess from that program, just the keys are slow to respond on it. And if you do have any IT issues in your CV, please make sure to raise your hand and let the IT proctor come right away and take a look at it. Because if they don't document that they had that you had IT issues, they're not going to give you extra time to finish the exam. So there were no like really crazy topics tested in the May CP. There were like people always say, oh, will crypto be tested? Or nowadays the generative AI is, is the new thing. So everybody's like, well, like, we will get a case on AI or will that be tested? None of it was really there. A lot of the AOs were quite repetitive. There was really one major curveball when it comes to financial reporting. And that was an AO on hedging. Believe it or not, we got a question on IFRS, uh, sorry, ASPI hedging question, a forward contract, and how to do accounting for it. I'll, I'll talk to you more about it in a moment, but essentially a lot of people didn't know how to answer it, and that was the complex topic. But besides that topic, I'll just name a few topics that came up in the CV. Revenue recognition under ASPI, intangible assets under ASPI, account receivable impairment under ASPI, uh, which is essentially a financial instrument, and under management accounting, activity-based costing. Uh, cost allocation. Those are pretty straightforward. Under assurance, we had audit planning memo, we had WIR, we had procedures, reviewing the junior's work. Under PM, we had KPIs. Uh, we had various decision analysis like outsource, quant, and qual. So nothing really too weird. It was a pretty standard exam. And, and I know if you ask your peer, they'll say it was pretty damn hard, but I don't really think so. I wouldn't find, I wouldn't classify this exam extremely hard because there were previous exams that had much, much tougher topics. So nothing too bad. It was pretty repetitive. And um, the, yeah, the only curveballs was that we had quite a bit of uh, complex MA topics, and especially for the PM role. And I'm seeing this pattern two years now. In May exams, the PM role tends to have quite a bit of difficult AOs, while uh, the assurance and the others seem to be a little bit more straightforward. Like, I'll give you an example. In September 2022, the CFE before this, uh, we had in assurance role, no audit planning memo. You may have seen audit plan memo in your PEP exams. It's a very common topic, but we didn't have it. And it was a big surprise to a lot of students because it comes up in every CP. But in this CP, we had it without any issue. So it was there. So in, in September CPs, the assurance role people, you get tough questions. In May exams, PM people get tough questions. And finance, finance is tough, tough always. Finance is no exception. Doesn't matter May or September. You always get this really strange questions you've never seen before. 
And tax is very technical. A lot of questions, a lot of calculations. So you got to be really good with tax if you want to nail the tax competency. I'll be back up here. So I'm going to jump to my other screen here and I'm going to walk you through the day one of the CP exam because we had two cases there. Uh, we had the KTI case, which was the new case. And, and the second case was the CTI version two. So I'm just going to share my other screen here and I'm going to show you what was on those exams. So jump here. All right, let's go to CTI and KTI. All right, so CTI. So CTI version two was for students who didn't pass uh, last May and, and actually they had a choice between the two cases, but uh, it was mostly written by students who writing the second time while KTI was for the first time writers. Uh, so CTI was about creative toys. It's like a toy company. And this, um, this exam had um, not a lot of curveballs. It was actually quite short. They, it had three strategic issues, as you can see here. It was uh, about some sort of an app that this toy company is manufacturing called a math app, something about building blocks and coal pair. And they also had a constraint, a $3 million cash constraint, meaning you were not supposed to recognize anything uh, beyond this. So we had three strategic issues and likely three operating issues, which is a little bit strange. Usually we have two of them, which was on KPIs, but CEO incentives, and then moving away from the mission and so on. So typically, Day one of the CFI has four strategic issues and two operating issues and one big picture issue. I'll say one more time, four strategic, two operating, and then one big picture. This CTI case was a little bit strange because it had actually less questions than normal. It had only three questions, strategic ones instead of four, and it had three operating instead of two, so a little bit more here. And he also had a constraint on 3 million, which is pretty normal. So it felt a little bit shorter. And a lot of students who talked to me, they said it wasn't too bad, actually. It was pretty manageable. Uh, obviously, the there were some issues with like understanding the quants. What do they really ask you to do? But generally, format-wise, it was, it was pretty manageable. Let's go to KTI now. KTI is a little bit more interesting because more people uh, wrote that case. So for KTI, it was the opposite of CTI. Actually, we had five strategic issues. So we had one big picture issue, which was on the uh, $4 million cash constraint, meaning you couldn't have recommended more than $4 million. There was a second big picture issue, which we call strategic direction. And that was about, should I pursue short-term or long-term? And then we had four strategic issues, which was, uh, should I pursue a long-term contract, acquire a new company? Uh, should they choose this company called Leaf and partner with them? And should they keep or sell this other patent they have? as well as a contract with a U.S. firm, and then two operating issues, which was on supply chain and strategic direction. So let's let's step back for a second. CTI, three issues. KTI, five issues. And you have the same four hours to solve both of them. So this is, what some, this is something you should prepare for. They love changing things up and making things complicated for day one by giving you an extra case or a, not an extra case, a minister required an extra strategic issue you have to tackle, such as in this scenario. The quants there were not too bad. They were pretty straightforward, usually to answer day one quants. And you may want to write this down in your notes because it's super important to answer the day one quants. You want to look at the objectives of the company and also look at the information in the appendix. Those two informations will tell you whether uh, what quants tool you're supposed to use, whether it's, uh, for example, profitability, CM, uh, one of those applies, or let's say a payback. So the quants were pretty straightforward for students to find. I think the only really challenge in this case was just the time management because writing five strategic issues in such a short period of time was quite, quite difficult. So a lot of students didn't really have a chance to finish the fifth issue. All right, so there's our five issues for uh, KTI and then three for CTI. So in day two, we had three FR questions and three MA. In this table you're looking at right now, you're going to see that Statistically, in the last uh, last CFIs that we had, I think we were we like 12 CFIs at this point, um, we are having a pretty clear pattern of 13 AOs in a CFI. I'm going to annotate on my screen here for you. So you can see that um, over here, we have 13 AOs coming every, every single day too. We have 13 AOs, as you can see right here. And the number of FR and MA questions seems to be either 3-3 three, three or 4-2. Right, as you can see in this table, it's free, free or four, two. And for the May 2023 CFE, it was a free, free. Going into the exam, I told my students, uh, guys, be careful. You're going to get either free questions or, or two or four. So be smart about it. Be strategic about it. And I'll tell you some strategies on how to balance those AOs a little bit later. But expect this many AOs for your September exam. I'm quite confident that in 
in your September exam, you're gonna get either three free or four two. So three MA, three FR, or four two, either combination. You will notice that earlier from 2017 and 2016 or 2015 it was a little bit weird. We had like 12 AOs. Sometimes we had six, zero, five, zero, and so on. If you look at this part of my slides right here, uh, that's that's really old and the exam pattern has changed quite a bit in all the years. And we don't really have this anymore. We're pretty clear that it's gonna be, uh, the breakdown is gonna be uh, like three, three or four, two and so on. So just keep that in the back of your mind when you go to the exam, you are gonna get FR, you're gonna get MA. Um, you'll notice in 2023 M column, uh, I have ASPI right here. Look at look at the um, look at the standards before it, FRS, IFRS. ASPI, IFRS, ASPI. Then we had like two IFRS here, two ASPI here, two FRS. So going backwards in time, it was pretty clear we had two IFRSs, then we had two ASPIs, two IFRSs. And then in here it became like one or the other. We had one, this one, one, this one, one, this one. And then we had two IFRSs back to back. So one of the most frequently asked questions I get, you know, what are we going to get in the day two? What is going to be the standard? And I put out a video, video on it, you can find it on my channel uh, before the CV, where I said, well, I don't think you can get free IFRSs because that's a bit too much. And I've never seen it in the last 12 years where they do free IFRSs. So using this data, I predicted that we're going to have an ASPI case. And yeah, it was just a pure prediction. I could have been damn wrong, but it did happen to be an ASPI. So good for folks writing the CV because you love to agree with me. A lot of people find IFRS harder than ASPI. Generally, the standards are shorter. It's a little bit more simplified. There's not that many rules. So, so yeah, it was an ASPI exam case. And what are you going to get in your September? Probably that's what you're wondering. I don't know. <laughs> so this one is very hard to guess for me because uh, part of me wants to say you're going to get IFRS in your exam because uh, looking at 2021 and 2020, you will see that it was like one or the other. It was like flipping back and forth. Like for every uh, for every ASPI we had, it was followed by IFRS, then ASPI, then IFRS. So my thought is since you got ASPI now, we got ASPI now, you are probably going to get IFRS. That's one part of me thinks that. Another part of me thinks that they may want to do again, double, double. So you may get ASPI. So this one is something I'm not going to try to predict because this one is pure 50-50. Uh, for May, I, I had a pretty good feeling it's going to be ASPI for, but for your exam in September, I really can't guess. It could be either one. So you guys really got to study both of them to be super prepared for this exam. Going back to the AOs I was talking about. So uh, from my form, we had the RevRec, which was, which had like a billion hole question, intangible assets, uh, uh, AR, and the AR had two sub-issues within it. You had foreign currency AO for AR and also financial instruments, which was about air impairment of AR. And if you don't notice, account receivable is actually a financial instrument. Uh, for the MA side, we had the ABC costing. They were You were given a cash budget and you simply had to revise it. And then you had to categorize or allocate, excuse me, allocate costs. You had to categorize and allocate the costs. So, so you can see there were quite a bit of versatility in these AOs. And one thing I like, the for the first time in, in this May CV, after the pandemic has been over, the financial statements that you get in the day two exam, they were preloaded into the system. A preloaded financial statement essentially means that it would um, you didn't have to type out the financial statements. They were already in the Excel as a second tab in your secure clan software. It essentially meant you could have copied the numbers into your working tab and quickly crunched the numbers. This made some people believe that they may ask you a question where you have to revise the entire financial statements, but we didn't get an AO like that. Chances are you may get it in your exam. You may get financial statements, draft financial statements, and one of the AOs may say, please revise the financial statements based on the FR adjustments. This makes sense because if the financial statements are preloaded, then it's quite easy to copy them and make the change. And we used to have AOs like that previously when they were preloaded. So maybe add to your notes now, uh, expect an AO on financial statements that may need uh, revision or financial statements that uh, you may need to adjust based on the preloaded uh, preloaded numbers. By the way, it's not just the financial statements that are preloaded. Anything more than 10 lines is preloaded into the secure client software in day one, two, and three. Here are the AOs that came up for the assurance. I, I kind of alluded to this alluded to this a little bit earlier. So we had audit planning memo. Classical comes up every time except for once it didn't come up, September 2022. We had two procedure AOs. One was on environmental statements, some sort of a website environmental statements they had. And that one on a specific section of the company, AR payroll and the general, general administration. We had a junior auditor do some work and you were advised to review the junior auditor's work and provide comments on it. 
WIR, control weaknesses, very common. And then that curveball, that biggest and most difficult question in the entire exam, hedge accounting. How do you do accounting for a forward contract? And I put a guideline there for anybody who's curious. Uh, ASPI 3856A62A has a guidance on how to do accounting for it. What are your thoughts on this? Maybe take a second to think about those AOs. I'll tell you my, my thought on it. Number one, procedures. Pay attention to it. This is pretty damn, predict, uh, pretty damn consistent. You do get a lot of procedures. For the first one where you see the audit planning memo, it includes the whole ramp. So risk, approach, materiality, and procedures. So let's count it. You have to do procedures on FR issues as part of your ramp. You do another procedures on a website environment statement. And you do another procedures on the specific section of the company, like AR or whatever. So three AOs out of like seven AOs, and there are three AOs, about almost half of them are on procedures. So add this to your notes, become excellent with procedures. You must be good with procedures because for sure, 100% you're going to get at least one AO on procedures. It may be substantive procedures on FR, or it may be test of control procedures to test uh, whether controls are being followed or not. You have to become good at structuring procedures, understanding how many do you need to get a pass, understanding what is the level of depth needed, how do you do a purpose on it. So dedicate a big chunk of your studies on procedures and, and analyze the solution keys that do give procedures so that you understand the structure, how to write it quickly, and write it in a way that makes sense because a lot of students tend to memorize procedures and just put it down, but that's not very smart. You have to write procedures in a way that uh, makes sense for the company, that answers the risk, and it's not generic. It's very specific to the company because it is it is graded very deeply in the in the CP. Okay, so make a note of it. This is probably the biggest takeaway for assurance writers is that procedures are coming up very often. Okay, next one PM. So it's the same slide except on the uh, side I added the AOs for the PM. We had strategic direction um, AO come up. It essentially said where is the strategic direction of the company, uh, governance structure, outsourcing. So it was a quant and qual and KPIs performance measures. So what are the performance measures? What are the KPIs? And they are thinking of changing suppliers. Give your comments whether they should do it or not. And lastly, pricing. So for this one, I'll add this. Um, out of all these AOs, the, the common ones that come up for PM riders, it's KPIs. KPIs and performance measures, it's super common, super common to get a on that. So become good at uh, performance measures, financial and non-financial, and also become good at uh, analyzing uh, out, like decision type of questions, such as outsourcing, should you buy or sell? Um, should you continue developing something or stop developing? So keep or drop. Another good thing about PM role, if you're someone writing the PM role, another advantage you have over assurance riders is that it prepares you for a day one of the CP as well. The day one of the CP consists of essentially four PM style questions. The four strategic issues that you get uh, are on quants. You have to do a quants on it, which are similar to the PM quants, and you have to do pro and con analysis. And that's it. You don't do financial reporting or assurance. This is all you get. So PM role writers have that slight advantage over assurance and others in that, in a sense that it helps them uh, understand uh, what are the, well, it helps them tackle the day one as well. Okay, tax people, these are the AOs that you got. Um, you had an AO on corporate taxable income and corporate tax payable. This first one is very classical. It comes up all the time. Um, you were asked to discuss the tax implications on the FR issues. If you had, let's say, the intangible asset, what does it mean from the tax perspective? A couple of GST AOs, actually two of them. One talked about the deadlines of GST, penalties, interest. And then one talked about the review and uh, asked you to review and recommend on GST. Stock options, owner compensation, salary, or whether they should incorporate and create a personal service business. Sale and lease back tax implications, and then an easy one to analyze a T4 and identify errors. Uh, like one of my students said, that was like a, a gift. It was like super easy. If you're writing tax for the CFE, you should definitely study corporate tax payable. This first one in my list, it, it comes up very, very often. Every CFE we see that AO come up. And also the GST, HST, because it's been recently added to the comp system. It wasn't always there. It also comes up quite often. So make sure to study GST, HST implications. If you're not taking tax role on a CP day two, your knowledge of tax has to be at extremely high level. You really need to know the basics of the tax topics, 
the stuff you're seeing here, like the stock options for employee employer, it's not going to be tested because it's, it's it's at the elective level, not the core level. So you don't have to study stuff like that. But for example, salary versus dividends, you can definitely get that question at day three. It comes up very often. But for the more complex ones, like the sale and leaseback, stock options, that's too complex for day three riders. You don't have to study it. Okay, finance. Uh, we had this sales come up. Valuation, hedging, source of financing, and capital budgeting, uh, and also another valuation came up question. So, uh, valuation is the most commonly tested finance day two role AO. Uh, usually, you have a complex valuation. It's not a simple like a bit multiple. You can do five minutes. No, 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 no. It's more DCF, CCF. Uh, you have various adjustments you need to do. They're really, really complex valuations. Sources of financing in involves both quant and qual. You have to do an analysis and determine how much quantitatively you will get from this option. And so qualitatively, which SOF makes more sense. So SOF stands for source of financing. And capital budgeting is an intensely complex NPV calculation. It's like NPV you've never seen before with, again, various, various adjustments. Uh, you have to use a different work rate. You have to take into account the CCA tax shield. Super complex. So if you're writing finance as your role, be ready for quants. Be super ready for a lot of calculations and quants because that's the big part of finance. So they say the PM role was very weird. Um, it was unlike anything I've seen before. And frankly, speak, frankly speaking, I, I get this question often from students. They they do say like it was like nothing I've never seen before. Um, again, it's for it's for May CP because the board of examiners knows that in May mostly people from corporate are writing the PM role, so they make it very complex. But for the September exam, I I tend to find that the PM role is a little bit easier, so you shouldn't have any problems with the PM. Now I should be careful when I say the word easy because I'm sure a lot of you will disagree, but it is not as like it's a little bit easier to cache the information. One thing that made PM extremely hard for this CP compared to the others was that there are not a lot of case facts. Usually you, you're given a ton of case facts to do your qual analysis, the pros and cons. For this CP for May 2023, there was very few case facts present. So the skill you needed to have is to get the take the small information and figure out what kind of case facts I can extract from it to write down my analysis. And uh, I expect it to repeat in a September as well. I expect they're going to crunch down the number of case facts they give you because in the board exam report, that's one of the comments they mentioned is that students are having difficult time uh, using case facts and being specific uh, in the way they analyze. They're being too generic uh, and also complex AOs. That's one of the things they said they're going to test you. What it means for you, strategies, you should study complex non-routine FR questions. As I said, the hedging came up, so you should know those kind of complex topics. You should practice every past day two exam case because most people fail CFE due to day two. Um, sure, day three is harder too, but from my experience, when students call me and ask me for help, it's usually a day two problem that they have. You must understand what it takes to pass the CP, aka the passing profile, because this determines the strategy you need to use to pass the CP, and you have to manage your time well, especially in the day three of the CP. Here's a table showing all the complex uh, topics that came up uh, that I recommend that you study. A lot of those have already come up in recent CP, like the earnings per share, it came up in 2018. Um, Operating segment, IFRAs, that came up in September 2022. Um, joint arrangement that came up in a recent CP as well. Business combination came up, foreign currency came up. Uh, so make sure to study all those complex topics in here. They they do come up on the exam. Don't think that they're not going to get like any of those tough questions. And by the way, when you get those AOs, they're like an entire page, like an entire appendix full of information you get on it. So it, it's not really so simple. You got to be fast in how you analyze it and go through it. But make a note of this and make sure to study all of those because they do come up on exam very often. All right, tough feedback on day for exam cases. It had too many EOs. Uh, the case one was very time constrained. And this is again like a pattern that I see uh, with day three. I'll show you a statistic in a second where you will see that day three exams tend to have like a, a bigger case in the beginning and then a shorter case in the end because you have like three cases. So the first case tends to be very time constrained. One of the students who emailed me said she was very happy that she did uh, the first case at the end. So she strategically flipped her cases because you get three cases. She did the third case uh, in the beginning as the first one, and then the second one, and then lastly, the first case at the end. And you're allowed to rotate them if you want. She was thankful because the third case tends to be a little bit easier. Not always, but it's usually a little bit easier. So it's more manageable than the day one, uh, than the case number one, which is a little bit harder. So for you, for September writers, the strategy is you must have a breadth of knowledge. Make sure to scratch the surface. Scratch the surface. Don't go too deep. It's about the breadth. Uh, again, you must understand the passing profile and how many Cs do you really need to pass because you can actually skip some AOs and still pass the exam. You don't really need to answer every single one of them. 
be careful with this, right? Don't skip too many, but a few skipped AOs is not going to be the end of the world. You will still pass, assuming other things are present and you must manage your time well. So we had three cases. We always have three cases in a day three. Uh, for the blueprint, they can do four cases, but we've never seen that before. It's typically, it tends to be three cases. We had a case called HG, which was case number one. Case number two was AJI, horsing around, funny name. And then case three was about CBA, Canadian Bobsled Association. Uh, the standards were IFRS, SP, and non-for-profit. Surprise, surprise, we had a non-for-profit AO come up. We, we, we were expecting three FRAOs in day three because you got three in day two and you have six of those. So three came up in, um, in day three and the non-for-profit had multiple sub-issues like baked inside it. Do you know what I mean? So there was one AO on FR, but the one AO was divided into three issues. So to get a C on it, you had to actually answer all the three issues. And those three issues were about contingent liability, impairment, and a contingent gain. So it had three actually components to one AO that you had to answer. And one of the guidelines for NPO is that you must uh, use ASPI if uh, there's no guidance in NPO. So the, the trick there was to do the ASPI. So the third case was 70 minutes. Second case was 80 minutes. And the first one was 90 minutes. This is what I was telling you, that the first case tends to be longer and more complex. I'm sure somebody out there is thinking, if they tested it in May 2023, am I going to get it in September? I'm thinking no. So this is one prediction I'm going to make, and I'm pretty confident about this. Uh, all of you out there in September, you're not going to get an NPO case. I'm, I'm pretty sure about it because they test NPO once every three, four years. There's a huge gap between them. Never they've tested it back to back. So you know what? You can put it all away and not study it. You should be okay. That I'm pretty confident about. So IFRS and ASPI. So let's check out the AOs that came up. I organized it by competency. So under FR, we had a rev rec question. It was IFRS 15. So three years, most people said it was super easy, not too complex at all. We had a least ASPI question, super easy. And then NPO was a little bit challenging. If you didn't really know NPO, it would have been super challenging, but the first two were pretty damn good, pretty damn easy. For MA, we had variance analysis, break-even point, and students say it was okay-ish, not too complex. And remember in day two, what do we have? We had uh, activity-based costing, revising a budget, and then categorizing costs, which was like a very qualitative type of AO. So MA was pretty easy too, or at least the topics were pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, brain analysis was complex, but at least it was something you've seen in your in your AOs in Core 2 and, and other modules. So it was not bad. From finance, we had three AOs, cash flow, payback, and source of financing. You will notice I use a lot of shorthand like i don't write the entire term i just put two or three letters like you'll see here va bp cfpp and stuff it's just so easy it's so much easier and that's one tip I, I will leave you with when you're taking notes in your cpa studies you don't have to write out the entire thing that's going to take too much room in your notebooks just abbreviate everything into short form and just use the shorter version it just just makes more sense so va bp cfpb all those things are very fun and easy to use strategy we had a swat we had like a little table where you had to speak about risks and then speaking about the mission and then the tax said corporate taxable income incorporate versus sole proprietorship and then CRA questions like uh, what happens if we have like a loss can we carry it forward and backwards it was pretty easy for most people last one is assurance I didn't cover this one so we had audit versus uh, compilation we had a question on um, audit procedures and then another audit planning memo it was just a RAM part of it so risk approach materiality, you know, to the procedures. What do you think about the audit AOs? Pretty easy, right? Audit versus compilation, audit procedures, and the audit plan memo. Like something you've seen like a million times probably, right, in your study. So again, it was pretty manageable. So not too bad at all. Um, that's why I said like this exam is, um, it's not really as bad as people make it out to be. It's, um, it's, it's quite a, I don't know, some AOs are repetitive. It's just the way they phrase it. That's really the complicated part. But if you do all the previous CP exam cases, you should be okay with passing this exam. It shouldn't really be that challenging. And I'll give you more resources and tips on how to get you prepared and ready for the exam. So where are we right now? Where are we right now with the exam? So here are some statistics for you. Uh, this is for day three. This shows, uh, I showed this for day two and I'm showing it for day three now. Like how many AOs you get in day three. So we saw in day two is pretty consistent. You get 13 AOs. For day three, we get about 19, like 18 or 19 AOs. That's a lot of AOs in one exam to write. So in the three cases that you get in day three, you get about 19 AOs. Three of them are usually a far, 
about three of them are MA. Sometimes it flips depending what came up on day two. And it's very consistent that you get three AOs in all other secondary areas. You can see that all of those areas have three AOs that are coming with it. So in your exam, in your CP, be prepared to have at least three AOs on strategy, on insurance, finance, and tax in the day three section. And the AOs I've shown you in my presentation, you can expect very similar AOs to that because they do repeat the same AOs over and over again. So it's not too bad. Um, this slide right here is showing you the time limit of the day three exam cases. So you will see that in minutes, uh, the, the last case tends to be the shortest. I mean, take a look at it. You will see here that uh, this is 70 minutes, the, the exam we had. And then we had 75 minutes here. We had 70, 70, 70 over here. And then the first case tends to be the longest. It tends to be 90 minutes long. It's not always like that. If you know, if you look at this uh, graph, you'll see that sometimes it doesn't follow that pattern, but more or less the, the third case is a shorter one. You are allowed to write the third case first. If you want to do it, by all means, go for it. But it's probably going to confuse you. So I, I do recommend following in the same order. Write case one, case two, case three in that order. But definitely manage your time and don't go over your time limit. Like when your 90 minutes are up, move on and, and don't uh, stop writing anything more than that because time management is crucial for day three. All right, let's look at uh, the uh, September 2023, like what I expect, what I predict for the exam. Um, I expect there to be more emerging topics. We didn't see that many for this CP, but I do expect more in yours. So uh, the AOs were very, very easy, very not easy, but very uh, consistent in May. But for September, you may get like a couple of weird AOs on emerging topics, such as generative AI, such as uh, cryptocurrency. I've been waiting for some time for it to come up. Uh, you will get data analytics. You may get a question where you have charts and you have to analyze it. There will be a big emphasis on the big picture issue on the day one exam case. And unfortunately, it's taught very poorly in a, in a capstone too. The way they teach you how to catch and analyze this big picture AO is very complex. And in capstone, they don't really teach you that well. So make sure to study what is big picture issue. I have a blog post on my website you can check out where, where I talk about it. And expect day one quants to be unclear, time constrained, and expect more complex question. Like we talked about, like we had hedging question, we had operating segments. Uh, we had EPS, business combination. So those complex FR topics do come up on the CV. Be prepared to tackle those. So here's my five-step approach to preparing and passing the CV. Five steps. Understand the exam. Prepare a study plan. Start studying right now. Start with technicals and get marking and support. Let's go through it step-by-step step and I'll dig deeper and I'll explain how to, how to go and analyze each of those steps. Number one, understand CV. So what is CP exam about? What are the number of hours? What are the number of AOs? What are the rules of the exam? What is the passing profile of the exam? But understand the, the scheme of CP, like the structure and the format, so you can adequately prepare for it. Because if you don't understand what's tested on the exam, then it's going to be very hard for you to really prepare for it. Uh, another resource you can use is, is my YouTube video, which is called Guide to CP. You can find it on my channel. It gives you a really clean breakdown of the entire exam. Secondly, prepare a study plan. How much time off do you need to prepare for the CFE? How many, how many weeks of time off? I would say um, more the more the merrier, but no more than eight weeks. I think eight weeks is the absolute maximum. And a lot of people have told me that they get bored studying eight weeks and they start forgetting things they started in the beginning. So perhaps four to five weeks is the sweet spot. And that doesn't include the exam week. So if you're writing in September, um, around August 8th or August 10th, the Monday around there is a good time to take time off. That is about like four weeks before the exam because you need that full-time study leave to get out from all the distractions, uh, get away from your work and eight hours a day, just study and write a lot of cases because we have a lot of cases. I'm going to show you in a second how many cases we have. You need time to study. If you're an ITA, internationally trained accountant, you will need to start studying three months in advance because you're not familiar with the Canadian taxation system and our ASPI rules. So you need to start studying way more in advance, but you should also take about four weeks off before the exam to fully concentrate on exam preparation because this is a huge, huge exam and you don't want to take any chances on it. Here's a sample study plan that you can prepare. Uh, this is the one that's uh, given to you. Here's a sample study plan that's given to you in the capstone too. And then here's another one you can prepare yourself. One is in Excel and the other one is Word. You will see that it's quite straightforward. You simply take a calendar and you allocate every single week and every single day what you're going to study. You can be very specific and you can say, I'm going to do chapter three FR. I'm going to do chapter two FR. Or you can simply say, this is my FR week. I'm just going to go through and study everything I can that week. 
and make sure to integrate some cases there, like day two case, day three case, et cetera, et cetera, integrate as part of your uh, studies. Step three, start studying right now. It is never too early to study. I, I've never heard of a student say I, say, I study studying too early. They said I started studying late, but no one has ever said I started studying too early because we have a lot of cases. At this point, we have about 47, 47 cases uh, that are available to us with solutions. That's three day one cases, which you'll get in Capstone 2, 11 day two cases, and 33 day, day three cases. And I, I'm not including the May 2023 CF in this list here, but I'm going to write my solutions to the May 2023 and it'll be available on my website. I'll leave a link for you in the description of this video when I upload it to YouTube. You can download it. So on top of this, you can also download the free day freeze from uh, 2023 May and also one day too. So you have even more cases to study with. It's going to take you a really, really long time to study it. Should you study the 2015 and 16 cases? Is it really necessary? It's up to you, but um, I, I find there are some really good AOs in there that you should you can practice with. So yeah, I, I suggest to go from 2015 all the way to the newer cases. Study, write all of them to the best of your ability. Start with technicals, right? If you write cases and you don't know what you're writing and you get like NC across the board, it's not really going to help you. So begin with a technical review. And in the beginning, 80% of your time should be spent on studying the technicals, specifically FR, MA, and your role. Find your study style. Find how you like to take notes, whether on a computer or on paper, but keep track of your information and create flashcards, study sheets, and anything that helps you prepare. In the D12, I showed a screenshot here where you can access to. They're going to give out flashcards, but it's not very in-depth. It, it doesn't cover every single topic, just the more commonly tested topics, but it does miss a lot of topics. So uh, I do recommend to use this resource, the flashcards that CPA gives you in Capstone 2, but you should prepare your own additional flashcards because you want to cover way more topics than they have over there. I created my own FR notes that cover every single ASPI and IFR standard in a very concise manner. This is not a resource you can get to study the FR technicals. It has a lot of memory aids, which I'm going to show you in a second. And it also is updated with 20, for 2023 and contains all the latest technicals that you need to know. It's not a resource you may consider getting it. You will see here it's very concise. It goes step by step. It gives you a, in bulleted format every single um, every single standard you have there. And yes, I have a lot of memory aids. I find that uh, for financial reporting, it's better to memorize the easy, small standards. And for the big, complex ones, like uh, like IFRS 15B paragraphs, where you got to copy those chunky paragraphs, you can look it up in a handbook because handbook is open during a CFE. But for simpler FR topics, you should memorize them. So I'm going to give you a couple of memory aids that I teach to my students that you can utilize as well. If you've seen this from my previous YouTube videos, I've added, I've added a new one. So you, you'll get something new today. Number one, employee versus contractor. This is not for actually, it's for tax, but it's still pretty fun. So you can remember uh, the rules for testing, whether an employee is a contractor or employee with the memory aid, I see okay. Like I can see okay. It's intention, control, ownership, chance of profit and loss, ability and integration. Audit memory aid, use of auditors experts. You can remember the cooked expert. Competence, objectivity, obtain understanding, capability, evaluate, and determine the need. So if you get an AO on assurance on the audit expert, you can look up the CAS standard, but it's very time consuming. You can simply write down the first letters and then fill it in and, and make it a, a full analysis and you'll get your C out of it. So remember, cooked expert for audit expert. Here's an FR1. It's on intangible, internal developed intangible assets. It contains three parts. Number one is a definition. Number two is recognition. And the third one is development. It's IC Feb, Feb CRM, and IC Farm. Is, this is something you can look up in a handbook, but if you simply write down these titles and put it in there, it's so much easier, so much faster. Here's another one. It's on betterment. How do you know betterment exists? Well, there's uh, four things you can look at. The quantity of output went up. The life went up, the operating costs went down, and the quality went up. If you have this clock, QLOQ, then you know there is betterment. So you remember betterment is clock. Here's one for balance scorecard. Uh, remember the balance scorecard sections with the memory aid, Cliff. Customers, a learning, internal process, and financial, CLIF, Cliff. So those are the sections, the four perspectives of a balance scorecard. Here's another one. It's um, assets held for sale. It's Ask Sam. So if we have RFRS 5 question, you, you can remember it with this memory. And actively marketed, steps to locate buyer are there, changes to the plan unlikely, uh, sale probable, available for mid use, and management committed to plan to sell. So those are like fun ways to remember really big topics. They're really helpful. And I, and I use it when I wrote in my exam too. 
Here's a new one, it's for IFRS 15. Uh, how do you remember the five steps of IFRS 15? Think about I star. I star means identify contract, identify separate performance obligation, determine transaction price, allocate transaction price to each performance obligation, and recognize revenue as each PO is satisfied. And it's totally fine to use these labels. As you can see, there's a quote from a marker who said that uh, they don't they don't mind point form. You don't have to copy the exact sentence from the handbook. They actually prefer marking exam papers that are a little bit more point form than bulky paragraphs. And they work really well. Here's a, one of my students who said that memory aids helped them remember and answer the AO really well during the exam. And last step in the preparation for CIFI, get marking and support. If you don't get your cases marked, you're not really going to know how uh, how well you're performing. Capstone to mark some cases, but it's not all, all of them. And you're you're welcome to have your own feedback on it, but I find Capstone to uh, feedback quite generic and it's not very useful. So it's always a good idea to get uh, feedback. There's a lot of free support options available for you. I, I highly recommend you get a study partner who you're compatible with, somebody who you can meet on a regular basis. You can mark each other's papers. You can discuss topics together. You can quiz each other using the study, uh, using your flashcards. So try to find a study partner from a resource. I have a Facebook group you can join where you can meet a study partner. Uh, the link will be in the description below of this video. You can try to get a mentor from your company or go to CPA networking events and try to find there. So you can go on YouTube and find a lot of free information. And CPA Canada website has all past exams and solutions to it. So you can check it out as well. On the paid column, if you want, you can get a paid support as well. You can get a tutor who, who sits down with you one-on-one -on -one and explain the concepts. The great thing about tutors is they're, they're private. They're one-on-one. -on -one. You can ask any question and you get that 100% private attention. The problem with tutors is that that's the only thing they bring into the table. They simply see you and they just answer your question. A coaching program is a little bit more advanced. A coaching program includes tutoring, but it also has more materials like study materials, uh, flashcards, notes, all, all the content is there as well as marketing services. So I have what you call a coaching program, a program that... Uh, help students prepare and pass the CP. It's called CP Review Days 1, 2, 3. It essentially contains all the stuff that I mentioned throughout this presentation. It includes, includes those memory aids. It includes additional cases that I prepared, which are predictions of what may come up on exam. And by the way, a lot of the AOs in my cases do come up on exam all the time. There's a checklist of topics to study, checklist of commonly tested topics, historical AOs. There's live classes. Every single week, we have live classes similar to this. So if you're enjoying the session, you're going to get something like this where you, you can ask questions, you can get support. There are sample answers. Uh, for example, I'll, I'll add the May 2023 sample answers and a ton of, ton of support. The way I mark cases is more in-depth than Capstone 2. I go inside your Word and Excel and add notes so you can see exactly what you need to change to become better. The videos are very immersive. Uh, they're not just somebody speaking over PowerPoint. You will see me. And also the live classes with me are also immersive. It's going to be a Zoom session. So you'll be able to see me, hear me. I'll, I'll be taking your questions live. So it's a very immersive and engaging experience. Pre-recorded lessons that walk through answering the CP cases so that you understand the basics of CP and the strategies. So if you're busy, you don't have time for the live sessions, you can watch those pre-recorded lessons to learn more. And, and then you can attend the ones that you, you can come to. And by the way, the live sessions are recorded and you can watch later. There are historical AOs to help you uh, prepare by analyzing the past data. And there's a lot of support, other support items like uh, templates, uh, a speed, type, speed typing application where you can practice your typing speed using CPA uh, wording because you can always tap, practice your typing in third-party software, but you, you are practicing with words that are not related to CPA. The application I use gives you CPA-related terminology and it checks how fast you're typing to, to help you become faster typer in this exam. I have a day one quants toolkit, which has a lot of resources preparing for the quants. And last but not least, you get a discount on per program if you're interested in taking PERT, if this is one of the requirements, both um, EVR and PPR will benefit from this program. There's a lot of good testimonials. I'm sure you're aware of it. And you can also Google and find out yourself. And with that, I wanna close off the, today's webinar. And as I said, I wanna give you a lot of chance for Q&A.